Okay. All right. Thank you, sister. Except for the blue one. I have a few housing items. Uh, I just want to make sure I think it's just some of the, <coughs> not that the comments aren't relevant, but some of them are going to be refined material. Sure. And I can certainly help, you know, send you some refined language, but I think the primary driver for housing is the consolidated plan probably from Valdosta. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt, as far as making sure that we're consistent with, you know, we have a good overlap and coverage there between that approved plan. You'll see the video later, though. Yeah, that's good. Uh, under issues, what I hear about all the time is high electric bills. Yes. Because people paying 500, sometimes 600 a month in electric bills. Mm -hmm. There is a way to deal with this, which might be related to CBD. CBDG. Uh, that, yeah, that thing. Or there's apparently other sources of money. I was just being told earlier today about St. Lucie, Florida. There's a program where they do weatherization and solar panels. It's funded. I didn't get where the funding came from, but I'm sure if you ask them, they'll tell us. And I know that Houston, Texas, at least used to have a program where they would go into a neighborhood and then knock on each door and say, who wants to sign up? And what they were signing up for if they did it was weatherize your house, maybe change out your air conditioner to something much more efficient, and, you know, put in insulation, and do solar panels, and then do it neighborhood by neighborhood so they didn't have to be continually rolling to a different place. They could just go a few doors down. I don't know how that was funded either, but I'm sure if we asked them, we could find out. So the issue is high electric bills. The opportunity is to find a way to do weatherization and solar. Very good. Okay. Okay. John, you think it was local government? You think it was power companies? I wish I knew the answer to that, but I know we can find out. The mayor at the time in Houston was one of my classmates. I can ask him in St. Lucie. Uh, she's like got videos on YouTube, the mayor talking about it. So I'm sure we can find out. Yeah, St. Lucie's a pretty place. Yeah, I wish I could answer your question off the top of my head, but I just don't know right now. They have two, two price schedules here, right? You mean like summer and winter? Yeah. Yes, sir. One. For Georgia Power, I don't know about Fort William City. George Power has two, one for the summer and one for the winter. And it becomes outrageous in the summer. Mm -hmm. People are spending all their money. By the ratio of people's <coughs> income to do <coughs> rent and home prices, probably. And, uh, uh, by the percentage of people living at the lowest poverty line. I mean, I would think. Um, but well, but in this the top plan, of the, yes, we, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. In this plan, at the top of the page, which says where development has occurred in wildland areas and are exposed to hazards, is that the development that's exposed to hazards, or the hazards exposed to development, or what is the what does that mean? Uh, that does need to be reworded to be more <laughs> At clear. Least. It probably, um, in wildland areas, wildfires are a hazard, um, and, but, but also the, um, the development is bad for the um, natural habitat. So, uh, so that could say something more like... Um, aren't, there, aren't there rules about where you can build, like they were talking today, about something being an environmentally protected area? Are people building in that stuff in that area anyway? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so what's uh, what's the mitigation you were talking about? Keep people from building there or uh, top of page fourteen. I think she I think this is probably referring to I thought it was like a forest fire. Like you build in wildland areas and to me I hear that terminology when you talk about well that's a danger for Potential forest fire, which introduces, you know, what do you do about making your house or your property more resilient to forest fire type of hazard? How about not building in the forest? Yeah, there's a good idea. 
How about all the we, wetlands? Or how stuff? about we find a way to educate people to stop calling the fire department every time I do a prescribed burn? Every single time. Every time what? To not call the fire department every time there's a prescribed burn. That would be there needs to be more public awareness of prescribed burns so people all know. Um, and yes, what she was saying, how about we try harder not to build in forest and wetland areas in the first place? The closer in you build to existing services, the, uh, the thing about sprawl for mm -hmm. in the bottom there, I'm sure Jason can tell us about Dr. Dorfman's report where he quantified exactly how much it costs as you go farther out and the difference between, you know, forests don't really call, you know, the sheriff very much, but people in neighborhoods do. So, and school buses, the farther you go, clearly the more it costs. And the bottom one may seem self-evident, but what we really need is a men's homeless shelter. We do not have a place for a man to stay 24 hours a day. The Salvation Army takes people in at 7 in the morning. I mean, it takes them in at 7 at night, and they have to leave at 7 in the morning. So if you have a disability, if you're a disabled veteran, if you, have, as we've had to do when I work for the Homeless Partnership, people coming out of the hospital need somewhere to be discharged to. With a broken leg, it needs two more weeks of recovery. They can't go to the Salvation Army if they're homeless. They can't go anywhere because they have to get out in the morning. Um, a full homeless shelter would have 24-hour, 24-7 care um, and the opportunity for, because a lot of people who are homeless are homeless because they're ill. Homeless because they are chronically ill uh, with either physical or mental illness. Um, and even though we have a vastly improved mental health system with a, a new benchmark 800 number that you can call and get someone to come and see about somebody, they're still having trouble finding places to put people, and a valid homeless shelter would make a huge difference. And I've heard people say for years, well, if you build that here, then the homeless people will come here. Well, you know what? They're here. They're already here. There are three or 400 every night in this town. And it's not about a shelter being here. It's about people who are here who have had disasters in their lives, who have had illness, who have had, you know, whatever. And they have no place to stay which doesn't even count the folks who HUD now considers homeless who are people sitting three or four families to a home. And we have lots of those folks. And technically, under HUD standards, those folks are homeless. I agree. In District 1, I, I can know about five young men now. They don't have anywhere to stay and I've been here and here. Yep. trying to help them. And they, they've been, we've been turned out at a room now. Well, and the Homeless Partnership, unfortunately, did not get funded for its major funding this year. And so it will not have the affordable housing. Again, the... Uh, uh, there are other agencies beginning to apply for some of that, but Department of Community Affairs has mainly uh, dealt with LAMP and the homeless shelter, in, I mean the homeless partnership in the past, and we really need a more comprehensive group that can do the housing. Um, this kind of tags onto one that's in the next section where it says continue or start a public housing program. We have a public housing program. <laughs> we have public housing all over the city, all over the county, and anybody who needs to know where that is can go to the Department of Community Affairs and get a list of them. It's, that is available as public information. We have lots of public housing. Not enough, but if this suggests we don't have any, that's incorrect. Yeah. Can we talk briefly about number two and four from the top of page 14? Um, so is anybody familiar with Hamilton Circle? Jason's going to remember this. I can tell he's flowering. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Famous uh, guest room. Right, right near that uh, rezoning that you guys just uh, did right. for uh, might be a Walmart. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, the inside, I think it's a Walmart. Mm -hmm. but that's the river. He said it. So anyway, um, it's, it's a circle. And in the middle of the circle, there's a retention pond. Okay, great. She keeps it from flooding. However, all the back houses back up to the retention pond. That could have been built so that they face the retention pond, and it could have been turned into, well, like a recreational pond. And that fits with uh, number four from the top, need to educate people about the benefits of 
common space and public meeting areas. I mean, it could have been turned into that. Mm -hmm. And just to follow on slightly, it's not just the public. It's also, um, dare I say it, somewhat the elected officials as well who really don't seem familiar with these ideas. Which, which also applies to the one right at the top up there that we were discussing earlier. When there was a proposal to build a subdivision on Cat Creek Road in the middle of an agricultural area, mm -hmm. one of the commissioners at the time, I had to explain to him at some length later why there might be some difficulty with putting a subdivision in the middle of some agricultural fields. He really had no idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name any names. He's not a commissioner anymore. Anything else on the housing issue? When we look at housing opportunity. that locally. I don't think you have to go through the state to do that. I think the state enables you if you want something like that locally, you can do it. But for us, it would, it would be, we would have to go to the county commissioners for them to adopt the rules and set something up where we could do that program. So it's not something we're just deciding meeting they're going to do no. and everybody hears about it. No. No. I mean, the closest thing we have is what Matt alluded to, where our ordinance does encourage conservation of subdivisions, which limits density if you protect and serve certain portions of the property. Right. That's We've probably that. that's probably the closest thing that we have in an ordinance. And it's just now starting. Developers are just now starting to become aware of it. And we haven't done one yet, but we have we've, we've tried half a dozen, but we've got probably one right now that's the most serious one we've seen that we, we hope there will be a model. In fact transfers the development rights within the yes, development and right. not across the county. That's right. It, place. It, it keeps rights on the same property. It doesn't transfer them Transfer development rights is like if Mr. McClendon and I took the rights from our farm and sold it to him. It's a different property, but a conservation subdivision keeps all of it on the same thing. What's the benefit to the development? For which program? The conservation? Conservation, like, like the internet. 
Um, the development to the, the benefit to the developer is if you agree to protect areas of your property, large amounts of wetlands, then we will let you have um, the density from those wetlands. So if you have, you know, an acre of wetlands, we will let you have a home that could go on that acre, but you won't be able to build it. So we'll let you move that acre somewhere else on the property that is developable so that you can protect that wetland area. And the cost of development is lower because the amount of infrastructure is less. So it's a more efficient use of land. The trade-off is you have an area, let's say the county or far away out, that is sort of a classified as a suburban density. And so you sort of accumulate that density to a more dense portion of the property and leave the rest of it as open space or close to open space. It lets the developers have houses without developing in areas that we determine to be sensitive. Wetland is probably the primary example. Yes, and we, we, we think it can be a good thing because it clusters growth and also protects the resources and areas where you don't want them to build. So we're hopeful that we're going to be able to put one on the books here in the next year or two with that happened. Yeah. Wasn't there just a rezoning on, I believe, Union Road that was supposed to be one? Yes, sir. But they haven't actually gotten as far as for planning what they're really going to do. They, part of the agreement with both of those areas is you have to have legal documentation. You can't just say in a flat, it's protected. You have to actually record something in the courthouse that's like a legal covenant. And they haven't gotten that far yet. Who keeps up with that? Uh, we would approve it through the county, and then it will be put on a permit. Cross that out, or just you know, say you want to expand. You can certainly use some more, you know.